Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this decision day. It's Monday, the 12th of October, and it's 9.30 a.m. This decision day is being held under the regulations which came into effect on the 4th of April 2020 in response to the COVID situation. I am Councillor Kelsey Lurney, Cabinet Member for Housing and Asset Management. Uh, first, a few housekeeping reminders to run through. Uh, please can I ask everyone present that your microphones remain muted and your camera is turned off whilst you are not addressing the decision day, as this will reduce background noise and avoid any unintentional disturbances. Can I also advise that the open parts of the decision day are being audio recorded and live streamed from the Council website. In addition, a video recording of the open sections of the decision day will be uploaded to the Council's YouTube channel in due course. When speaking and referring to the agenda papers, please make sure that you reference the page or paragraph number. Thank you. Uh, please note that the duration of this virtual decision day is two hours and any business not conducted after this time may be deferred to an alternative date or decision day. So please can I ask the Democratic Services Officer to confirm the names of officers present this morning. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, in addition to myself, um, Nancy Graham, Democratic Services, we have Richard Botham in, in the room and joining us um, virtually, uh, we have um, Barry Ann Lyons, Rachel Robinson and Louise Gill, um, Dick Johnson and also Catherine Knight um, from the legal team. Thank you. Um, are there any declarations of interest from councillors or officers present? Please use the hand up function to indicate and I will invite you to speak. Right, so we have no hands up. Um, item two, public participation. No members of the public have registered to speak under public participation today. Um, item three uh, and requests from invited councillors. I have received notification that one councillor, Councillor Lumby, wishes to speak on items four, five and seven. So Councillor Lumby, you'll be invited to speak at the appropriate point during the item for discussion. Thank you. Right, so we now come on to our first item, uh, oh. Central Winchester Regeneration Update, DD17, pages 5 to 24 of the Agenda Pack refer. So while we have a, we have formal decisions to make on Coitbury House and a property acquisition today, I am very conscious that it's some time since we've given a full update on the progress of the Central Winchester project and this in the seemed the ideal opportunity to do so and to run through the timetable for consultation and decision making in the next six months. Officers with the support of JLL and Arup have been doing a huge amount of work over the summer to maintain the momentum and keep moving forward on this very complicated project. Uh, we're close to the point where the public will start to see not only the full shape of the plans for laying out the area, but physical change too. Cabinet have been enthused by the outline proposals coming forward and I'm sure that when we move to the consultation phase that we will talk about today that the public will too. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Varian Lyons to make the presentation on this paper. Thank you, Councillor Lerney. Um, I think we've got a presentation. Rachel, are you going to be hosting the presentation and sharing screen? We'll Hello. Thank you. Hello. Yes, oh. Thank you. We'll just get we'll just get the presentation on screen. And, and, and as Councillor Ernie was saying, it's been a little while since we were able to share what we've been up to with you. So we've got a brief presentation um, to remind everybody where we've been and what we've been doing. And then there'll be also a presentation around how we want to consult with you on the proposals for the Central Winchester scheme. And then we've also got our um, uh, a presentation from low property consultants in regards to the decision for the day around Quickly House. 
So with no further ado, we will start with the content of the presentation. Um, next page, Rach. Lovely, thank you. So what we'll do is, as I said briefly, we'll, we'll remind everybody where we have come and where we started um, from the SPD. We'll then talk a little bit around how we want to then engage and consult with everybody on the proposals for Central Winchester. Um, we'll have a presentation around Quick Rehouse. We want to bring something forward on that quite quickly. And then we will be doing an update on where we got to or where we're currently at with the King's Walk proposals and um, a small uh, brief update on where we are with archaeology. So on to the next slide. What we have been doing, obviously, since we last met is basing everything on the SPD. Rach? I don't know whether we've got technical issues. There we go. So as you're all aware, we did a large consultation piece in 2017 and 2018, all around how central Winchester um, was to be um, developed based on the public feedback, what the public wanted, and the various different elements of such a scheme that everybody wanted to see and felt was really important. The vision, as you can see, is for a vibrant, mixed use, um, pedestrian friendly quarter with exceptional public realm and imaginative reuse of existing buildings. The nine objectives within the SPD, as you can see here, capture all that and everything we do on the Central Winchester scheme is totally embedded and based upon these objectives. So you'll see as we go through the presentation and then later on as we start to consult on what the proposals look like, you'll see how all these objectives have been um, incorporated into the, uh, the proposals. So I think we've just got a little bit of a delay, Rachel saying on, 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 on the slide update. So do bear with us as it, as it clicks through. So back in February of this year, following adoption of the SPD in June of 2018, we then um, procured and obtained the services of JLL in partnership with Arup as strategic advisors across the council, not just on central Winchester, but across all our portfolio of, of projects. Heavily working with us on central Winchester. And what we did was we worked with them whilst they sort of became familiar with Winchester. There was a piece that they did around competitive positioning, around where Winchester's strengths were, where there were perhaps gaps that we could look to fill. And sort of that really helped shape the roadmap review that we did. And what JLL helped us do was to look at where we where we were upon adoption of the SPD, which was our planning framework, and how do we work that up to become our development proposals? So we've got a really good strong basis in the SPD as our planning document. How do we then deliver that? So looking at the SPD, there were there, there's a range of different uses within that document, which I'm all sure you'll all be aware with of. And what we did with, with JLL was we, we came up with three different scenarios which tested the ranges within those options. So some of you may well have attended our open forum back in February, but those three scenarios were business not as usual, which was a commercially led scheme. There was also a residential scheme, which was housing for all. And there was also a cultural scheme, which was destination max. I do apologise, there seems to be something wrong with, 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 with our connection, but, but, but we'll press on. Um, and what we did was we looked at using the different ranges within the SPD to test if we went to one extreme of one range, for example, and led with a residential scheme, this is what it could look like. So we had the three different scenarios and we showed some very different looks and feels for how that might look. So we looked at some images and some ideas for each of those three different options. So if we can get those up, that would be really good. Looks like we're having a bit of technical difficulty. So what I'll do is I will, there we go. So business not as usual, flexible workspace, easy to sort of um, accommodate incubators, independents, smaller units, 
flexible creative spaces and let the, the local imagination with, with those startups and those incubators sort of see how they, they develop and grow. So it was very much commercially led, um, although there were other elements of, of residential and retail within that scheme as well. We then looked at the homes for all or housing for all. And again, testing out different tenures, different looks, different feels of housing and how we could incorporate that and make that also into an imaginative, creative, vibrant scheme with spaces to meet and, 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 and um, socialise outdoors as well as indoors. And it's testing some different options for housing that we've not yet tried in Winchester. We then also looked at Destination Max, which was a culturally led scheme whereby there was a large amount of area dedicated to creative um, and arts and theatre and events. And how could that look? Covered markets, covered walkways, very much heavily led with the cultural side. So that's what we've been doing. We've been taking all the feedback that came from those options that we presented back in February. We've taken on board everything that everybody said, the comments we had around we don't want it to be a heavily residential scheme. We want to see elements of the culture in there. We do want to see some residential. Um, so we've captured all that. We've then been working with JLL and I'll come on to a little bit more about that in a minute about how we then take those comments, work with those alongside issues around sort of the challenges we've got on the site, the viability and the deliverability and also starting to look about how we retain some of the buildings that we've got on the site. The SPD states that we will retain just two buildings, which was the old old um, antiques market, which is now the nutshell, and Wall Staples Hall. But are there other buildings that we could also incorporate and use to help along with the sustainability and the, and, and the reduction of the carbon footprint? So we've been working on all that. And alongside that, we've also been looking at how we might then deliver such a scheme because that is another thing that people are really interested in um, and so again we've been working with JLL on understanding what the council needs and should provide and 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 do what expertise there is out there in the market and when the right time to go to market is and, and with what sort of what sort of scheme so we've been working on all that alongside another key study that you're all aware of going on in in Winchester is the Winchester movement strategy so not only do we need to look at how the central Winchester site can develop and become a, an integral part of a vibrant city, we've also then working with how we accommodate what might come out from the movement strategy and how we accommodate the, the uh, aspiration to reduce the vehicular traffic through the centre of the central Winchester site. As you're all aware, the bus station currently sits within central Winchester. So we've been working really closely with uh, Hampshire County Council and the bus operators to understand how we can come up with a solution for the buses so that we can keep the, the, the bus passengers coming into the centre, but also unlocking central Winchester for delivery. We've also been working with local cycling groups and understanding, again, as stated in the SPD, a pedestrian and cycle friendly scheme is what we're aiming for long term in the SPD. So we are very much working with with our colleagues up at Hampshire on, on the wider movement strategy as well and the connectivity on how Central Winchester will connect with the wider city. So moving on. What we want then to do. If the slide will catch up. And I do apologise for the technical issues we're having is let you know exactly the sort of work that we've been doing. So we left off in. February when we presented at the open forum and also at the last decision day in March, telling you a little bit about what we wanted to do. And I think that I won't, we won't leave the timeline up there for too long because it's quite small, but, but what we wanted to do was to try and give you an outline of, of, of where we wanted to go with Central Winchester to keep the momentum going. So we had anticipated that we would be able to consult on proposals for Central Winchester in the summer and then going to um, a period of consultation and going for a decision on Central Winchester plans in autumn. Now, we weren't expecting COVID to hit, so what we've done is that timeline has slipped a little, but we are still very much on target and we have still very much been working through 
all those issues that we needed to work through before we can get to a formal adoption and approval of the scheme. So the next slide will show you what we've actually been doing and I can talk you through a little bit about that. So as I mentioned previously, we took all the feedback from the open forum and we have been working really hard with JLL on incorporating all those comments that came back and looking at what the scheme could look like on a balance of those uses, coupled with some elements that we need as a council to think about. How would we deliver such a scheme? How would the viability and the financing of such a scheme be accommodated and allowed for? Because it's a challenging site. Everyone's well aware that, that we've, we've had issues um, in the past with, with, with trying to get a viable scheme. And we really want to get it right this time by having incremental delivery, a very different look and feel, much more Winchester in line with what the SPD had stated in its objectives. So we've been looking at the viability and working out a financial strategy. To do that, we've been working closely with JLL to understand, again, what the market is for some of these different elements out there. So we've, we've run a study on hotels because I think it's widely recognised that Central Winchester is a good place to provide extra hotel space. But what is the market looking for? What would the market go for? So we've done a feasibility on that. We've also started to look at what we could do with keeping some more of the existing buildings. And I think it's widely known that we've done a feasibility study on King's Walk. How could we bring King's Walk forward to start the creative quarter in a creative hub off sooner rather than later? So we're working on the feedback from that and the results from that to understand what operators are out there, how we could deliver that sooner rather than later, and then how that would feed into the bigger, wider Central Winchester scheme. We've done some engagement and um, with, with stakeholder groups. We've had some conversations with, with key people throughout the, the various different um, community groups and, and various different other groups of stakeholders. And we will be continuing that when we start our sort of consultation on the scheme um, next month. So an awful lot of work been, has been done. We've refined the scheme a little bit. We've taken all the elements that people really liked from the three different scenarios, and we're just finalising packaging that up together to make a final sort of draft development proposals that we can share with you. So we have been quite busy over the summer, despite the fact that we've all had to do it online and, and distanced and, and, and virtually. So it's thrown up a few challenges and the timeline has slipped a little bit because of that. Some of the hotel study and some of the King's Walk study, we couldn't get hold of the people we wanted to get hold of at the right time to stick with the original timetable because people were furloughed, people were closed, and it was really hard to get people to engage with us when they were really just fighting to keep businesses going. So I think it's understandable that the timeline has slipped just a little bit. So the next slide, hopefully will come up any second. So yes, I think we, we have got a bit of a time delay. So what the next slide shows will be what we plan to do next. So as mentioned just now, we are near finalising the draft proposals for Central Winchester and what they might look like and how we might be able to um, or what our preferred option is for delivering those. So today we've got a decision day on bringing forward Quickbury House sooner rather than later for an, a, a, an interim temporary meanwhile use, although that, that's for some period of time. But what we then want to do is come back to a cabinet in November with those central Winchester development proposals in draft and also our preferred delivery option so that we can share that with you all and in public as the start point of a four week consultation period on those proposals and on the delivery approach that we recommend and which would be our preferred approach. So November the 10th is the cabinet date where we will be sharing those designs and those development proposals with cabinet we will hopefully be seeking approval to start the engagement period and we will then have four weeks throughout November and early December to consult on those and um, Louise Gill is on the call and she'll be explaining what that will entail a little bit later in the presentation. 
Once we've done that, we will be taking the feedback received from the, that consultation. We will be compiling it and we will be then considering and exploring what those comments are and looking at um, what all the feedback is and how we can then uh, consider that within what the draft proposals are shaping up like. We will then go to a um, decision with that cabinet in February um, so that we can share those proposals in final form and seek approval, not just for the proposals, but for how we want to go ahead and deliver them. So you can see between now and February the 10th, we've got an intense period of in consultation, finalising the proposals and then going through the, the final approach to approval, which we aim to do in February. Following February, you can see there on the slide, there will then be the nitty gritty of getting down to actually implement those proposals. And we will share more about what that might look like when we have our final decision on the scheme in February, because it very much depends on the delivery approach that we take. So that's where we are and that's where our next steps are. The next slide, I think, is going to lead us on to how we want to go on and share those proposals with you and what the consultation is going to take shape and look like. So hopefully that will catch us up in just a second. Brilliant. So we've got a couple of slides now on consultation. I'll hand you over to Louise Gill. She is um, on board and working with the Winchester City Council officers purely on central Winchester and purely on the period from now until um, our final approval in February. So what Louise will do now is to give you a little bit of an insight as to what our consultation programme is going to look like um, as we start to roll that out in November. Louise. Thank you, Varian. Um, so um, we really want to ensure as many people as possible get involved in the consultation events that we have planned for Central Winchester. Um, and so I can run you through um, those this morning. Um, we'll be undertaking a number of activities to reach out to all our key stakeholders and the public. Um, we'll be hosting um, some one to one briefings uh, where stakeholders will be invited to attend uh, via MS Teams. Uh, we'll also be hosting a number of online consultation sessions. We'll have dedicated sessions set up for specific groups and also open sessions that will be open to the public and publicised through the media and on our social media platforms. Uh, we will make sure that we can offer guidance to setting this up for any individuals who may not currently use them. Um, we'll also ensure that the session slots are offered over a series of weeks over the four week period um, and also at varied times of day to ensure that everyone who wants to take part is able to do so to fit around any work or family commitments that they may have. We've also given a lot of thought to the best way to share our plans given the current environment. Um, and in the absence of being able to host a, um, a, a, an actual um, exhibition where people can come together, um, we'll be hosting a virtual exhibition online to showcase our proposals and to allow us to answer questions from residents and stakeholders. This will include a briefing section um, along with a 3D room displaying exhibition panels as would happen in a, a real life um, exhibition scenario. Um, we'll also place exhibition panels uh, and by way of posters on the Broadway, signposting to areas where people can feedback online via our website. We'll produce a flyer uh, that will introduce the proposals with clear information and images about the plans and guide people to uh, find out where they can get onto the virtual exhibition online. Um, and this will be sent out digitally. And we'll also set up a dedicated page on our website, which will include details of the plans linked to the virtual exhibition and also details of those consultation sessions that will be taking place online. As Varian mentioned earlier, 
we will be sharing full details of the activities and timings in November. We'd like to keep everyone informed and uh, anybody who would like to get involved, please direct to register at the dedicated email address that we have there, um, which is cwregen at winchester.gov.uk. I'll now pass back to Varian. Thank you. Yep, lovely, Louise. Thank you very much. So it's a bit of a, a sort of um, heads up that this is coming in November. So do watch out on all those different channels that Louise has, has pointed out. And we will then talk you through and explain how you can fully get involved in the consultation on the CWR uh, development proposals as we roll that out in November. And again, like Louise said, we want as many as people as possible to get involved so that we can have your comments and hear your thoughts. So what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about Quick Rehouse, because as mentioned um, up, up at the beginning of, of the presentation, we want to start to bring some activity to the site while we're planning and, and getting the, the wider scheme um, approved and then started on site. So we have had Quick Rehouse as part of Central Winchester for some time, and it's a question of, is there something we can do with that? Um, to bring some activity to the site. We had plans to refurbish that as office space. And I think some of you who followed Central Winchester for some time may have been involved and seen some of the plans that we were looking at for Coitbury House. Right through that period and for some considerable time prior to those plans coming forward to redevelop and, and refurbish, sorry, Coitbury as office space, we've been marketing the building to see what interest there is out there. And through all of that period, both before our plans to refurbish and during the plans to refurbish Quickly House, there was no interest from office occupiers in that space, in taking that space as office. So we were looking at how we deal with Quickly House. We had a pause on that work to refurbish whilst we considered what our options were. And during that time that we were pausing, we were we, we had we had an expression of interest as a result of the marketing exercise that we were doing and, and, and advertising and the approach was from low property guardians they came up with uh, uh, an offer on the building and although it wasn't particularly what we'd had in mind for the building we did explore that and what we would like to do is to progress with a lease or a license to low property guardians so that they could take Quickly House and bring it into use. So what we've got today is we've got um, members from low property guardians to come and present to the audience here today just to explain a little bit about who they are, what they do and how they want to work on Quickly House for a period whilst the wider scheme comes to fruition. So. Um, Jack and Tim from Low Guardians, I'm going to hand over to you to run through your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Varian, and good morning, everyone. Hi, guys. My name's Jack, and um, I've been speaking with Varian throughout the process, and Tim Lowe is obviously the founder, and he's joined us as well today. So we're just going to run you through. I think, Rachel, are you going to be organising the slides for us? Hi Jack, I am, yes, and um, the slides are up, but I think there's a little bit of a delay, unfortunately, so hopefully we'll get to that any minute now. Okay, fantastic. That's okay. Um, so just, just a bit of background um, about ourselves. Um, we are a, uh, we are a property guardian company. Uh, in effect, what we do is we manage vacant buildings on behalf of our clients. Um, typically, they are going through redevelopment. Um, and what we do is in the interim is we fit these buildings out to habitable standards, um, comply with all necessary health and safety uh, uh, standards in doing so, and effectively license uh, the rooms out to young professionals and key work uh, and key workers. Um, we started in 2016. Um, we've we've just touched over 3,000 um, guardians who've been able to enjoy this affordable accommodation um, across London and the southeast. Um, and, and actually, we had a, a site 
um, in Winchester um, on Quarry Road, uh, a, a care home there, which was very, very popular um, with um, a, a many young professionals and key workers um, living in Winchester who were struggling to find safe, secure and most affordable, affordable um, rental accommodation close to where they um, live. We um, we work with all range of different clients from from large developers, property funds, um, local authorities, housing associations, and NHS trusts. Um, and, and as we've grown, we've looked at different ways in terms of having social impact in the areas we work in. So one of the programs we're going to speak to you today about is, is our low key program, which we feel would fit very well with uh, Coitbury House um, and, and the vision for, 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 for Winchester as well. So. Um, uh, Rachel, if you could click the next slide. Uh, I, I just, I just keep going. I think that, like you said, there's pro probably a bit of a delay anyway. But I, I think basically from, from our side, um, just some of the main areas um, for, for you to, to 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 be aware of is that we we take full control once once we take on a building, we take full control of the management of that building um, and we make sure it's 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 secure um, so it's it's not a victim of squatting or vandalism and, and fully compliant um, we, we very much pride ourselves on, on on the conditions which we provide for our guardians so with, with Coitbury House we'll be um, fitting it out and um, putting new showers kitchens and um, really transforming the space into a, a really um, exciting place for, um, for, for for our guardians to live um, we also make sure in terms of from a compliance point of view that it's it's fully compliant uh, with with the relevant fire health and safety checks. Um, we take care of all the maintenance. Um, so we have an in-house maintenance team. Um, so whenever there are any problems with the building, we can be there um, straight away and ensure that that building remains fully, um, fully maintained throughout. Um, another area which is kind of worth just mentioning with you is that we would be able to effectively um, mitigate the empty rates liability into the property uh, and take on the council tax um, liability. We, we have an understanding with the VOA that when we place guardians into properties, we're able to take them out the empty rates and put them to council tax. So there is a saving there for, for, for Winchester as well. Um, and I think from our point of view, one of our things we're most excited about is, is the community element and, and the impact um, Coitbury House can have in terms of providing um, key workers and young professionals with, with very affordable accommodation. We're typically 50% below market rent, um, very close to where they are, uh, close to where they um, close to where they live. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to um, Jack, who's going to talk you much more detail about the low key programme. Um, it, it looks like we might have a bit too much of a delay on the uh, on the presentation. So, um, uh, Jack, do you want to going to yeah. talk about low key? So, low key is something that we're really passionate about, and something which makes up a large part of our business and the way that we approach different projects. Um, the reason low key came around is that we were looking at who guardianship serves. At fifty percent below the market rate, it's it's safe to say that it's always pretty popular with people, especially with the locations and the maintenance and the fit out works that Tim had spoken about earlier. But we wanted to make sure that guardianship was serving a bigger purpose. And so, sort of two or three years ago, low key, the idea for low key sort of came around, and it's something that we've pushed, and it's grown from strength to strength. What low key essentially is, is about the prioritization of key workers with in close proximity to the properties that we're taking on. So for Coitbury House, what we'll be doing is going out to the local schools, local charities, local hospitals and all the wider key workers services that are provided within Winchester. The reason for us doing this is because we want to make sure that this opportunity is given to them in the first instance. Um, and also such a large proportion of people's salaries are going on their rent. And it means that sometimes people aren't able to follow up and chase these careers and unlock these aspirations, as you saw on the first slide that we had, um, and achieve what they're looking to achieve by sort of living and working within Winchester. Obviously sort of key workers, salaries remain the same sort of throughout the country and Winchester is an expensive place to live to help with that retention across the city as well. There's so many people giving so much in their day-to-day -day roles and we want to be able to support them. 
So as you can see on this slide, we've housed over 400 key workers so far across a number of our clients, including sort of Lambeth, Ealing, Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, Newham, NHS Property Services, as well as a number of housing associations. And we're keen to be part of that with Winchester as well. And we'll be looking to speak to people within Winchester City Council and hopefully make some introductions and explain what we do and educate people on guardianship and be able to help as many people as possible. So if you move on to the next slide, it talks about sort of low key guardians and a little bit more around what I was saying about reaching out to local hospitals and schools. But one other thing that obviously the property at Coitbury House won't be made up entirely of key workers, but that's who we want to prioritise in the first instance. When we actually talk about the guardians that will be living within the properties, they will all be socially responsible guardians and thinking very much from the aspect of what can they give to a guardianship as opposed to what they can take from it. Um, each of the individual guardians are extensively vetted to make sure that we've got the right people with occupying that space. We recognise that Coitbury House sits right in the middle of the Winchester regeneration plan and it's about important for us to make sure that they are the ones upholding the values of Winchester City Council at all times. So in terms of the vetting process, we will conduct face-to-face -face interviews, we'll obtain sort of employer references, bank statements, we'll also do DBS checks on each of them and also character references as well. All of the guardians are licensees as opposed to tenants. This means that they're on 28 days notice, giving both us and your, giving both them and your development plan flexibility as well. And it means that we can have a really stringent approach to if there is any breaches of license agreements, then we can move those people out of the property and we can make sure that it's going to someone more deserving in that particular instance. The key thing that Tim was talking about earlier is about this level of community. We know that when we get it right with the right people living in the building, the community element to guardianship is something which it not only makes us incredibly proud, but it's a fantastic way for people to make connections, forge relationships and develop their lives within a particular area. So we put a lot of emphasis on sort of community spirit, people getting together for film nights, yoga, barbecues, and we'll actively donate towards that as well. We used to run a scheme called um, Skill Swap, whereby we would have certain guardians teaching other guardians particular skill sets. And we're interested to sort of forge those, forge those links with Winchester and keep you all abreast of what's happening within those communities and through the communication plans as well. Um, Rachel, if you want to move on, I think we've got some pictures and some um, some bios on some of the low key guardians that we have living within our teams. So, yeah, so as you can see and sort of on the screen, we've got Shiara, who lives within one of our properties, Sean Tizard, Martha Jones, all holding down key worker roles. And most interesting, I'll pick one as opposed to taking you through all three of them. Sean was actually someone that we met through our connection with LandAid. We did a lot of work with LandAid in terms of raising money and um, providing help towards that homelessness charity. And Sean was actually became so interested in what we were doing that he was keen to join a guardian scheme as he was sort of new to London and wanted to establish a base and make some friends. And I think Sean's even gone on to become a head guardian within one of our buildings, which is a fantastic advocate for someone that we just worked with at a charity and we forged a relationship with. And it's been a fantastic way for us to see those guardians sort of evolve and become bigger and bigger part of our company. So if we then have a look at the case studies of some of the buildings that we look after, I've just included two here. So Ealing Council, which was is part of a regeneration programme as well, but this is mostly focused on residential flats. Ealing is a really interesting client for us. We've been working with them for a long time. We have a large number of guardians with them across a number of different properties. And for us, it was about showing the way that guardianship, guardians and tenants and the wider community can all blend together. The guardians within sort of the Acton House Regeneration Project, they've been able to live alongside these residents and become part of the community. They support local shops, they support local charities, and essentially living side by side with the tenants means that they're not only securing the properties, but adding to that community as well. Um, and the next case study is Camden and Islington NHS Trust. 
So this is a large care home. So it's slightly different in terms of the way that we would need to manage it. So we have 41 guardians living within that property. And again, it's a lot sort of tight to knit community because they're all living in close proximity. But it's about making sure that we're partnering with Candy and upholding the values of what they have. And that building has served so many people in the past and it continues to do so at the moment. It's something that we're really proud of the way that that scheme has worked. And it means that actually that there was antisocial behaviour, there was issues before we moved into the property and now we've had no reports of anything like that for them on their wider scheme. So it's been a really positive experience for everyone that's been involved in it. And then finally, so we wanted to take you through a little bit about our foundation as well. So the foundation is something that we've been thinking and look thinking about for a long time and finally came to fruition. And it's it's something that we're incredibly passionate about here. So it's as you can see, it says we use a system of grant giving, community engagement and promotion to focus on improving affordable housing in key city areas and the welfare of local communities. And it's something that really drives our team. It's an important factor of why people join our company that belief behind what we're doing and unlocking that aspiration through affordable housing and taking that one step further. So we do it through three main channels, as you'll see on the next slide. Um, so it's about network. So the low community is diverse and extensive, and we want to make sure we're connecting the right people with the right resources. And so by facilitating relationships with people, it means that the foundation is building with housing associations and property services to ensure that we're reaching out to key, work, key workers who need our services. It's what we're talking about in the earlier slides, whereby we're connecting with the local schools, charities and hospitals and making sure that people are aware of guardianship and aware of the positive impact that it can have. We also have a giving arm to the foundation, which sees us with our buy one, give one scheme. So each month, um, the Low Foundation will pick a charity that it works with and every property that we take on and every guardian that we have that moves into a building will actively give, I think, £250 to each charity for each building and £10 per garden moving into a property to that particular charity. We're really interested sort of with Coitbury House and working with Winchester City Council to learn which charities that you're closely affiliated with and making sure that this building matches up with that as well. And for us, it means that we can forge closer relationships also with the guardians. A lot of the guardians either work for charities or have affiliations to them. And so they've been really forthcoming with suggesting different people that we should be working with. And we've recently been working with ACT, um, who's an LGBTQ plus um, charity. And what we've been able to do in terms of supporting them has been great and sharing those stories. And it means that people have a connection to what they're doing and that community element really comes to the forefront. And then finally, low key as well, where we're talking about helping aid retention, giving people the opportunity to continue with what they've always been passionate about through affordable living. And as we move on, I think finally, we've got a couple of testimonials as well from a couple of our clients. And these are the ones which are related to the case studies that I took you through. So Leon Joseph, the regeneration manager at Ealing Council. He talks about sort of the significant saving costs, the social value of having us there, the legal agreements. And it's very key to us that we're helping him with his scheme. He has a lot to manage in his day-to-day -day role in terms of dealing with tenants, decanting housing schemes, and making sure that people are in a secure environment. And guardianship has enabled his scheme actually to be put forward for an award whereby it's the way that that particular for the way that regeneration projects within that borough are working. So it's something that we're incredibly proud of. And he was really forthcoming and actually wanted to give a testimonial as opposed to us speaking with him and seeing whether he would do one. So it's some, he's someone that we're really proud to work with. And Duncan Winter, um, who we've been working with at Candy for some time, he's really supportive of the schemes and is someone who's very actively involved in what we're doing. and is always chasing us for sort of updates on people with living within the properties and the community element to it and he feeds that back to his team and we've been really proud to see how that relationship has flourished and 
and also just to sort of finish off like we're really excited about the way that this winchester city council's regeneration program is going to work and we're very excited to be part of it and should anyone have any questions or anything like that please feel free to get in touch with us directly and run through anything that we may have missed during this presentation jack tim that's brilliant thank you very much for bringing us up to speed on who you are and what you do and your plans um, for Coitbury so what we wanted to do was to let the low guardian team come and present so that um, everyone can understand who they are and what they're trying to achieve and see that their vision and their aspirations are very much aligned to to what we want for the longer term view of central Winchester and if we can start that ball rolling sooner rather than later then we're starting the change already so all the details are in the report uh, chair around the agreement and the form of license that, that we would be proposing to grant the low it is a property license for a period of two years where as you've heard low guardians will will, will take Coitbury house on license and operate their guardian scheme as they've outlined here in the presentation today. So not only will that enable us to bring some life and some activity into what at the moment is, is, is quite a, a sort of quiet, sad backwater of central Winchester, it will also enable us to, to stop the building falling into disrepair. It's been empty for some considerable time. We're having as a council to maintain that building. We are responsible still for paying out the business rates on that building. And we are very aware that other buildings that are on the central Winchester site have not fared very well. And we are having to spend an awful lot of money maintaining and repairing and securing those buildings. So this seems an ideal opportunity for us not only to save money for Winchester City Council on that side of um, Coitbury House, but also to, to give something back, as Jack was saying, to our key workers, to our local community, by enabling um, a low, a low cost, a sort of affordable, more affordable accommodation, um, albeit on a temporary term of, of two years. And as Jack said, it, they're on license, so it, it really is a, a temporary um, arrangement. But what we're hoping to do is, is that some of those guardians that will be um, potentially living in Coitbury will then go on to be part of the community, take part in whatever we're doing on Central Winchester, and, and it gives them a sense of, of, sort of um, belonging, I guess, and that's what we're trying to do across the whole scheme long term. So that's a little bit of a presentation and a real whiz through the sort of ideas that we want for Coitbury House. The full details are in the report. Um, and happy to take questions on those, Chair, when, when, when you're ready at the end of the presentation. I'm conscious that, that time is moving on. So I also wanted to let you know where we are with King's Walk. Some of you will be aware that we commissioned Turner Works with Worthwhile Works to do a feasibility study on bringing back King's Walk into use for a cultural hub. So if we can look at the next few slides, what, what we did was, um, the SPD states that we should be looking to use existing buildings on the site imaginatively. And I think this is a really good example of how we take that objective from the SPD and, and put that into practice because Kings Walk is um, right in the heart of central Winchester. It is let to small independent units on the ground floor as retail, but the upper floors currently are empty. And we've asked Turner Works, working with Worthwhile Works, to do some research into what that could look like and the sorts of people and the sorts of businesses and the sorts of organisations and companies that we could have in there. So it can range from ground floor retail to upper floor workspace. We can have health and wellbeing studios. We could look at individual um, bays for startups and incubators. They can be makers, they can be artists. Um, and what we want to do is, is understand how we can bring that forward together with, as the current slide you're seeing, with some enhancements to start the ball rolling towards our exceptional public realm, which is another, um, another objective within the SPD. So the, SP, the, the, the feasibility study that, that Turner Works and Worthwhile Works did was concluded at the end of August. 
throughout September, we've been working with JLL to understand what the options are to bring that forward. Now, there's an awful lot of work needed to bring the upper floors back into use. It is open floor space at the moment, but there are no services in there and we have to be really careful that we can provide the right utilities, the right access, the right safety, etc. So we're currently working up options into how we might be able to bring forward Kings Walk sooner rather than later. And what we intend to do is to work up those options and bring those back to um, give a further update at the November's cabinet. So we're not quite ready to press the button on that yet because there are some issues around financing and viability that we just need to work through and also how we can deliver Kings Walk Creative Hub or Creative Quarter ahead of the main and the wider scheme of Central Winchester without jeopardising some of those future aspirations that we want for the site. So we are working on it um, and we will come back at a, at a later date with further proposals and a further recommendation on how we do that. So this is just to give you an idea of where we're at. And the other item that we just wanted to cover is archaeology. We have started on site with our archaeology investigations. Um, we reported back in February that, that, that the programme was, was a question of, of getting boreholes in so that we can start an intense period or a prolonged period of water monitoring and soil monitoring so that we can really understand not what's beneath the surface, but just to understand that whatever is beneath the surface of the ground on central Winchester, what condition that is. Because as we're all aware, the national planning policy is, is reserved in situ for archaeological deposits. So we are abiding by that and we need to understand how well preserved any deposits might be under central Winchester because that will then go on to inform the type of development and the type of foundations that we can go on to use across the site. Once we know what the conditions of any deposits might be, we need to do our best to preserve them if they're well preserved. So we've started the um, sampling, we've started the, the weekly testing and what we will do over a period of time is build up a database of what the soil conditions are like and how the seasonal and annual variations affect the conditions underground. And that will then go on to inform how we then develop the site out in due course. So that concludes the presentation for today. So I will hand back to Councillor Lurney for uh, the next stage of the decision day. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Varian. Uh, now, that was a, a long and comprehensive presentation, but we did feel it was important uh, to get all that information out into the public domain. Um, and I think people will be very reassured about the amount of work that has been going on and where we are in this process. Uh, before moving on to any questions, um, I'd like to invite uh, Councillor Lumby to speak. Councillor Lumby. Uh, thank you, um, Chair. Or I have some notes somewhere, I'm just trying to find them. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak and um, thank you everyone for the, uh, the, the very informative presentations. Um, can I focus principally on Coitbury House? I've got quite a few questions, I'm afraid. Um, first of all, can I ask how many people will be accommodated here? how they will be selected and whether this will be uh, housing for local people or for people outside the district. I can't see any information on stats on this or assessment of the need or demand um, for that. Will the council be able to allocate people or is this simply left to the guardians? I think that do cause uh, various worries um, in relation to that. Um, secondly, given what we've seen with student communities, communities in relation to COVID, what reassurance do we have this won't be a problem here? Um, we heard a lot about community, which normal circumstances is obviously great, but right now does have concerns. Um, thirdly, um, this expenditure is outside the budget, so it's extra, extra money. Given the current constraints, um, we should be sure this will lead to overall savings. 
in that context, are we happy that the estimated savings, a mere £17,000 a year, will be achieved? It will not take much for all that to be used up. Um, just quickly, a few examples on that. Um, uh, we, 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 we hear at 2.8 that the costs um, are £30,000 a year for utilities um, and Lowe's administration. But there's no reference to insurance costs. However, on page 23, you'll see that the council has the obligation to continue to pay for insurance. Um, how much will planning cost? Um, so have all the costs been taken into account to get into that 30,000? Also, in terms of risks, um, I see on page 22, the council will have full liability for repairs um, on the structure up to £100,000 a year over the two years. Um, we could terminate early, but that of course will give us our rates liability back and will cause a write-off of capital expenditure. So what is the likelihood of there being any actual uh, repair costs? Um, I noticed that we'll be carrying out structural and asbestos surveys. Um, what if these reveal a requirement for costs in excess of the £25,000 budgeted? And um, asbestos clearly um, is an issue. This is an old office building. Um, they are generally um, pretty pretty high amounts of uh, asbestos there, really expensive to move uh, and get out. Um, and of course, residential will have higher asbestos standards. Does that cause us a worry? Um, and so overall, do we have a worry that this £17 saving could be gone um, and we could actually end up incurring a liability? Um, fourthly, I'm near, I'm near the end, I promise. Uh, fourthly, um, is there really nothing else we can do to make money from this building? Um, as people commute less, for example, there will be more demand for what is called third space, somewhere between our homes and offices, where people can rent space to work remotely from home. You know, is there some sort of demand around that we, we could be looking at as some sort of meanwhile use? Um, and finally, um, the appearance of the building. Now, I haven't seen a building run by um, low before but i have seen other guardian buildings um and they can look pretty barricaded up um and actually appear to be squats um what certainty do we have on the external appearance um and how it would look from the outside um we clearly if there's a use we wanted to to add to um and give a feeling of activity um not add to the feeling of long-term decay that's obviously the major issue with central winchester regeneration so just what what assurance can we have that this will be attractive and kept in that way um that's all i've got for now thank you very much indeed right thank you councillor lumby um i'd like to invite uh, jack and tim to respond on the number and selection of residents and the external appearance of the building Sure. So it, it, in terms of the number of residents occupying uh, the property, we are estimating between 15 to 20. Um, we're just waiting the outcome of our fire risk assessment um, just to clarify um, and ensure that um, that building is fully safe, the number of residents within there. Um, just to also answer your point, all residents will be um, from the Winchester um, surrounding area. Um, indeed, when we ran our guardian scheme in Quarry Road, they all uh, lived and worked within Winchester. And that is a promise we can make to you as a council as well. Um, in terms of your question, in terms of the appearance of the building, I, I do sympathise with where you're coming from. Some of our competitors, if you look at some of their buildings, that they might appear to be squats from the outside. Um, we are planning to invest a considerable amount of, uh, a considerable amount of our own money within the building. Um, we'd be absolutely delighted to give you all a tour of the building and we very much want to use this as a working case study um, for how guardianship can be a force for good um, within uh, local authorities and within providing that type of housing. So I can assure you that that building will be kept in excellent standard both externally and internally and as very much as part of this process um, we are very much welcoming um, as many people to come around and see the building and meet the people living within those buildings um, to demonstrate um, to demonstrate the um, the, the quality of, of work this does to the local area. Right, thank you very much. Um, 
In terms of the um, external appearance of the building, I think uh, Councillor Lumby should be reassured by the fact that we do intend to apply for planning permission. Uh, so there is that there is that constraint on it. Um, it's also worth pointing out that this building is within the conservation area and we do have a duty to maintain it. Um, so potentially there would be expenditure involved there, even if we were carrying on uh, leaving the building empty. I think the um, issue about it having life back in it is really important. Um, as you mentioned, Councillor Lumby, uh, certainly getting the lights back on in the evening, I think will be really helpful to the look and feel of that area. Um, in regards to your other questions, um, I'd like to invite officers to respond. Uh, Berrien, do you want to take that? Yes, thank you. Um, Councillor Lumby, as, as you pointed out, on paper, the savings do seem, um, I think, £17,000 over a year, but that's actually quite a lot of money. And there are no guarantees that if the building were to remain as it is, that we would not have to spend more and more on maintenance and repairs. Um, the other building, as you'll all be aware, that I was talking about is, is Friesgate Medical Centre. Um, we had looked at doing something similar with Friesgate Medical Centre, but every single time that we tried to, to do something with that, um, in between visits, even between visits when Lowe were looking at it with us, um, vandals had got in and done more damage, the roof needs repairing. So we really don't want that to happen to another of our buildings on Central Winchester. So getting some life and some activity and some security back into Foybury is, is, is key. And with regards to your comments on um, asbestos, obviously Lowe and the team are really used to working with buildings of this age and we are fully compliant and will be fully compliant with any any requirements for asbestos. A lot of the surveys that we needed to do had already been done as part of the work that we had done on refurbishing Coit Brea's office space. So a lot of the work and the surveys um, that, that we would have had to have uh, uh, budgeted for at the moment have already been done. So um, looking at you know, the uncertainties of the future with the uncertainties of not knowing where the office market is going, what requirement there will be for offices. As I said, the building had been on the market for many years, um, even, even with the refurbishment offer, and we had no interest. So I think we don't want to postpone any decisions on bringing life back into the site any further by looking yet again at whether there's a different use. We've got a really good offer here that we can bring some life start to change the perception of Central Winchester into something that is a little bit more um, creative and cultural and more residential on the site, start getting the look and feel of what Central Winchester is going to be long term. So um, I think with regards to the COVID measures that you mentioned, obviously Lowe are going to be really well aware of the implications of that. We've all seen what's been happening when universities have gone back. Obviously, this isn't the same scale um, with between 15 and 20 guardians living in the building, but obviously Low will be well aware of that and there will be the necessary measures taken to, to do everything that they can to minimise that risk. Was there anything else, Councillor Lumby, that we haven't covered? Uh, I was just uh, doing a high speed check, but I think that was that was everything. So everyone's from the area. Um, we've got an assurance on that. Um, we've covered the COVID. Um, we didn't really go into detail on the costs, but I don't think we need to do that um, anymore. Yeah, alternative use and appearance. No, thank you very much indeed. Thank you all for, for answers. Thank you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions, Councillor Lumby. Uh, uh, following that, I would like to thank everyone who's attended. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank Jack and Tim from Lowe for their very comprehensive presentation and I'm sure that's been very reassuring uh, for people seeing it. Um, having listened carefully to everything that's been said, um, in addition to having regard to the contents of the report, uh, I am minded to make the decision as set out on page five of the report. Right. 
Right, so that's signed. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we'll be losing various officers now at this point as we move on to the next item, uh, which is the housing property acquisition DD18 on pages 25 to 29 of the agenda pack and page uh, 31, which is the exempt appendix. So thank you to everybody who attended for the central Winchester item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, right now, I think uh, this item is is very straightforward. Um, it's a fairly standard property acquisition of an XHRA property. Uh, would officers like to add anything to what's in the paper? Um. Yes, if I, if I could just introduce it very quickly. Um, the council has a first right of um, refusal under the Housing Act 2004. So we have a first right on EX right to buy property in purchasing it back within the first 10 years. Um, the key factors that we would um, take into consideration in repurchasing are whether we have capital funds available. In this instance, we have over 5 million available out of a budget of 26 million this year. Um, the property meets our housing needs um, and demand is established for this type of property being offered um, and assists the state management or in the future could be uh, meeting uh, future housing development needs. Um, the additional costs of refurbishment are minimal and the purchase represents value for money and meets the council's financial uh, requirements. In addition, it will contribute towards the council's housing objectives and incur eligible spend from right to buy one for one risk, uh, funds in the um, in the actual purchase and by applying this source of funds a cost floor of 15 years will be triggered that means that if um, if someone wants to buy the property in the future um, we'll get at least our cost back incurred in um, buying it now thank you thank you very much dick um, i have councillor lumby who's asked to speak on this uh, Councillor Lumby, do you wish to make any uh, comments or have any questions on the exempt appendix of this report or can we deal with the entire item in open session? I think we can do it all in open session actually, um, if that's okay with you. Um, right. I, I I have very little to say here, um, so I'll yeah. be very quick and we can all get to um, other activities. Um, uh, absolutely support this. It seems like, as you rightly say, a, a, a no brainer, something we should be getting on with. Um, just a quick um, question thought. Um, obviously, uh, many of us were at the Exeter City presentation on Friday. Um, and we talked there about their use of the housing company. We have our own housing company. They were telling us about some of the uh, advantages both in terms of finding uh, funding tax uh, legal um, a right to buy implications of using a company um, rather than taking it actually into the council itself is that something that we've looked at whether we can have this as one of our sort of seed type properties for the housing company or is that not appropriate for this so is it something we thought about um, that's all I had to say thank you very much indeed right Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Richard Botham if he'd respond to that one. Thank you, Chair. Um, the uh, the paper sets out why it works under the uh, it works the, the proposal works for us through purchase through the housing revenue account, and that allows us to use right to buy receipts, um, which if not used within a certain within within a certain deadline. Uh, we're, we're obliged to pay those back to the government. So we see this as good use of right to buy receipts, retains it in the housing revenue account. Um, so, so this particular property isn't one that we would look to uh, um, uh, purchase through the through the company. And actually, the, the financial model works better through the housing revenue account. So that's why we're recommending it at this stage. Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Botham. Uh, does that uh, does that answer your question, Councillor Lumby? Yes, no, very clear. That's a very good answer. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Now, the um, the recommendations and the options considered and rejected are contained within the report. Um, having listened to the uh, presentation on the item and the 
and having regard to the contents of the report, um, I am minded to make the decision as set out on page 25 of the of the agenda papers. Uh, so I will sign that now. Right, so that's done. Uh, that concludes the formal business for this morning. So I'd like to thank everybody who's attended and look forward to seeing you at another time. Thank you all. Hi there, it's David speaking. Just to say I've stopped the audio recording now.